Healthy Talk, Hospital Birth and Lactation, Part 2. I am Dr. Diana Dixon. I am a doctor of public administration, certified breastfeeding specialist, and certified lactation counselor. I, oh, yeah, there we go. I'm going to be joined by Julia Rose um, from Bloomin' Rose Lactation, and we're going to get started. Um, we're going to talk all about hospital birth and lactation. We're going to really talk about it. Instagram is Instagramming right now, so <clears throat> it kicked us out. We're back again. We're gonna try this part two. I think a bunch of other people got kicked out too, so we're back. We're gonna we're gonna work with Instagram because that's what we gotta work with. <laughs> we got any any other choices out here in these streets? So let's see if we can get Julia back. Reintroduce herself <laughs> um, because Instagram is doing the lovely Instagram things right now. So we make it work. We make it happen. Hey, Julia, <laughs> look at we got Instagram, Instagram. See, we are out here victims to Instagram. So right. It's all, it's all good. I said let's allow Julia to reintroduce herself because I think a bunch of people got kicked out too because I was like the numbers just kept going down and I was like, wait a minute. So yeah. yes, let's let's hear. Can you start over? I'm so sorry. I started the whole lab over. Okay. So can you introduce yourself? Yes, no problem. So hello, everyone. Happy Friday. So my name is Julia Rose. I am a registered nurse, certified breastfeeding specialist, and international board certified lactation consultant. We go by IBCLCs. Um, my background is labor and delivery, postpartum and lactation, all things women's health. I am entering my eighth year in my career as a nurse. So when I am not running my private lactation practice, I am in the hospital about four to five times a month as a labor and delivery nurse. I have two littles on my own that I have breastfed. Um, my first son, I breastfed him for 18 months. He, um, I nursed and pumped with him. There was no issues with him. You know, he latched in the hospital. And then once I got home, that's when I added pumping to my journey because as a working and busy mom, I pumped so that I could have an emergency stash, work stash, going out stash, what have you. And then with my second son, he is currently 14 months and we are still breastfeeding, but he had issues. Um, and those were issues that weren't even recognized um, in the hospital. Um, thankfully, I'm in this career, but you know, if it was a first time mom, I'm sure it would have been 10 times worse, but he had a tongue and a lip tie. So I had to exclusively pump to protect my milk supply until he had his release. And um, then we got him back to the breast, but I do nursing and pumping with him as well. Yes. So that's a little bit about me. <laughs> I love it. And so Julie is a safe space and place for pumping. She knows that, you know, I love that about her because that's not always the case all the time. Um, mm -hmm. So tell me, tell, tell us a little bit about how you got started. Why nursing? How this evolution has come to become a certified breastfeeding specialist, an IBCLC? Like, what was the evolution from nursing to this? Because you can be a nurse without this. So, Correct. you know, I usually it's a story. So if you want, whatever you want to share, <laughs> we want to hear. We want to hear. <laughs> Okay, so here is my story. So um, once I, um, within my eight year career, I was like 10 months in like a cardiac unit. And then from there, I went into women's health. So I've been in women's health seven years. And about two years in, um, I just noticed a lot of things with women of color, especially. Um, I noticed a lot of women of color would come in, they wouldn't have any knowledge, any education about breastfeeding. Um, they would be marketed formula, and they just wouldn't be told about breastfeeding, whether it was nursing or pumping, they would not have been told about it. I seen the, the lack, I seen the disparities in the hospital. And that is what ignited my fire. That's when I said, you know what, I have to start educating. Because when I was out, I didn't even start private practice or go into business right away. I just wanted to get the word out and educate moms and teach moms how to breastfeed and let them know um, that is a, that that's something that is available to them and that they are able to produce milk. And so by me seeing that firsthand working in the hospital system, that's when I was just like, okay, this is it. This is where I belong. This is my passion. And that's when I got started and up from there. Yes. So tell us, because I don't think people really realize that there are two different groups in the hospital. Like we think we go in and we just go in. Like they don't really give us, you know, they, we should be taking the education beforehand. Um, so, but I still don't think even I, you know, they don't really tell us all the things. Like you go into the labor and delivery unit first, you go all the things, you have the baby, and then you transfer over um, to postpartum or mother baby, whatever they call it. Um, so can you give like, 
you know, regardless of how people decide to deliver, um, as far as hospital, home, birth center, like, you know, just in general, preparing, preparing mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. having a baby. Like, what are, what are some of your thoughts on that? So preparing, um, that's the big word, doing, doing the work before, because I'm just going to give like a, a scenario um, of how it usually works in most hospitals and depending if it's baby friendly or not baby friendly. Um, so we're, we're going to go with a baby friendly hospital. Um, if you go in the hospital, okay, say you go give uh, birth, you give birth. And then within like an hour to two hours, we want the baby to latch and, you know, start breastfeeding. Um, your labor nurse, if it's a baby friendly hospital, they may have some extended um, training in breastfeeding. If it's not a baby friendly hospital, they won't. So you, you deliver, you're with your labor nurse and you're pretty much depending on them to, to latch the baby if you have no education prior to. So say you go in, your labor nurse does not know much you know, because it's their choice if they want to extend that breastfeeding learning. So they may not know much and you go in there and say you run into issues. It's not just an easy latch or an easy pump. You have issues where, you know, you have to pump and things are going on orally with the baby. You're stuck. If you don't do any of the education before, if you do not prepare, at that point, you're stuck because A, this is not to take a dig at the hospital lactation consultants, but this, because they're wonderful, I love them. I know a lot of hospital lactation consultants, but this is the system and this is how it works. There's a small budget allocated to lactation, very, very tiny. And so there may be one IBCLC to like 30 patients, okay? And then they have a baby. Girls, you're giving the sauce. My ears are, <laughs> you're giving the gist. So when I'm listening. <laughs> So there may be one, one IBCLC assigned to all these mamas and babies. Now you tell me logically, how is this IBCLC going to give you personalized care, going to sit down and spend the time with you that's needed if she has all these patients? It's reality, it's the budget, it's the system. And so that's why it's so important to prepare and do the work before, because if you don't and you depend on the lactation consultants in the hospital or the nurses, the doctors, time is milk and your journey can be. Time is milk. Time is milk. And then, and say, say you run into a problem where you need to pump. Like I said, you, like me, you need to pump to protect supply. Um, there's, you know, very little pumping education out there and shout out to pump a purpose because she be out here in these streets, y'all, but there is very little pumping education out there. And usually in the hospital, you're going to be given a pump. You're going to say, this is the setting to go higher. This is the setting to go lower. This is how you put it together. And that's it. No flange sizing, no settings customized to you. You're just going to be given this pump. And then you're going to go home to your pump and you're going to say, well, how do I use this pump? How do I measure my flange size? So this is why you have to prepare and do the work before so let's say so you talked about a couple of things so <clears throat> let's talk about do you and i didn't i didn't ask before mm -hmm. do you do we're we winging this y'all i'm just telling you we're winging this but i i know julia is about to i have work <laughs> so let's talk about the difference between someone that is doing do you do do you support c-sections if needed as well mm -hmm. okay so let's talk about about the differences people don't realize that there can be a difference with initiation of breastfeeding if you have a c-section versus vaginal so can we talk about that yes 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 so when you have a c-section typically after your c-section during your c-section your baby will leave and go to the newborn nursery to wait until you are done granted there's no complications you're done in an hour that is where you will go and meet your baby in recovery um, during that recovery period, your nurse may try to um, latch the baby and get breastfeeding started. But again, um, a C-section recovery is different from a vaginal recovery. With C-sections, sometimes the milk takes longer to come in versus with a vaginal. Um, sometimes there could be fragments left behind causing the delay in milk supply. Pumping, if you want to exclusively pump and you've already, you know, voiced this right away, there's a delay in that sometimes. So when it comes to vaginal and C-section, there's a big difference. And so again, preparation 
Consent is key because if you if you go in that hospital and you've voiced, you know, you've allocated what you want, what your plan is, what you're going to do, whether you're going to nurse exclusively pump, you know, you may have a better outcome. But there is a little delay in care when there's C-sections. There's a delay with getting breastfeeding started. And, and also, so like, I mean, I had two C-sections. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, you know, well, my first went to the NICU. Uh, so let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk mm -hmm. about that moms you know that have to be said because i need people to understand the real deal like yeah. you literally have and whatever complication that happened you literally get immediately separated from your baby like mine like, left breathing but he wasn't breathing five minutes before then like he came mm -hmm. out bacone macerated collapsed, collapsed at birth had to be resuscitated immediately taken to the nikki my husband left out but not only not only did my child leave me my husband had to leave me so mm -hmm. you one person in the hospital in the operating room with you and then if something happens with your baby most of the time most people are going to send the significant other if possible so since my son left out so i was left cut open wide open on the on the table mm -hmm. and everybody left me everybody like yep. you can get and you know i mean i needed my husband to go i was like go like i, I could talk i could breathe and go right mm -hmm. But I'm saying, can we, can we talk about that that type of, you know, what that difference is? You're going to be left. You could be left all alone, all alone in the room. Yes, you could be left all alone. And it could be some time, you know, before your providers get back to you or before your nurse gets back to you. And again, there's a delay. Time is milk. I mean, that time just adds up, adds up. And then by the time someone gets in there to even, you know, teach you anything, if you're like, okay, I want to... My baby is being separated from me. My baby, you know, things are happening. It's a medical emergency. I want to start pumping. It can be hours. And I've seen where it's six hours, eight hours until moms are given a pump, shown how to use a pump when their babies are separated. And at that point, what are they doing? They're giving your baby formula. And then what are we doing there? The more you give the formula, the supply. Time is milk. Time is milk. Yeah. No, it is definitely so very important. So let's talk about the com the complications you mentioned, right? You mm -hmm. talked about placenta let's even mention mm -hmm. the hemorrhaging at birth right and how mm -hmm. some factors you know because we don't i don't really talk about it because i don't want people to think that all of a sudden they hear the words for tank placenta but tank placenta is a, that, that's one thing that's going to take out a journey it's that <laughs> real but even yeah. the, or talk to them about the important things to talk to your doctor about if you hear the word hemorrhaging first of all it means that obviously it's a lot of blood loss that they've been telling you about it right because right. i think there's a certain amount. Sometimes they tell you, sometimes they yeah. don't, you know, but if mm -hmm. someone hears those words, retain placenta, hemorrhaging, what should be some of their next conversations to have with their doctor and staff? Let's give them some gems. Yes. So retain placenta, especially, I mean, if they do not get everything out right there at the hospital, your, when it comes to milk supply, it will continue to drop. When it comes to your health, I mean, that's like a life or death situation. You can literally bleed out from retained placenta. You can go septic. You can end up in the ICU. And so when you, if, say if you're in the hospital and they tell you you have retained placenta, you need to make sure, you know, somebody's advocating for you, whether it be your husband, your partner, to make sure that, that you've had ultrasounds. You know, they've went back and looked to make sure that, every single thing is out they need to triple check and not assume you know i went in there i got everything out they need to triple check okay and make sure that everything is out because it's it's just downhill from there if anything is left and then when it comes to hemorrhaging when you hemorrhage you lose uh, it, it's you once we call it hemorrhage is over a thousand milliliters of blood once you hemorrhage, you lose a lot. I mean, your hemoglobin has dropped. I mean, if you're anemic, things of that nature, your body really takes a toll. And again, that milk supply. When you hemorrhage, you, you most likely will have low milk supply starting out. So this is why you need to be prepared and you need to be working with someone that can help you get to back where you need to be. Yeah these people to hear you, see you, value, validate you. Like, you know, how do they do it? I mean, if they're a new mom, they did not have any, let's just be real, a lot of prenatal education. I mean, you could try, you know, to go to Instagram or go to the mom groups or whatever, but like you in a hospital, you, who you want to call and you on the table? You don't even got your phone with you. Exactly. So how, how do you, 
what do you what do you tell the the doctors like hear me see me like when you see the people first of all you can tell the difference the people that know what they talk about and people that don't you know so mm -hmm. those doulas lactation like professionals before you go in it can arm you even if you don't have them in the hospital with you that arm you with the education that you need so you can have those talks to understand like oh wait she kind of know what she's talking about you know what i'm saying like, correct correct yes sir no ma'am yes ma'am like you just listening to whatever they tell you but like what just if you get like a piece of advice of like what you see from the moms that come in knowing what they're talking about knowing what they're doing what do you hear mm -hmm. them say like we can't educate them on this lab we're not doing that but like what's right the the, the 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 what's the secret sauce like what do you start <laughs> to let people know like wait we need to really is, is there something yes well the, the, the secret sauce is this you have to um kind of interrogate if you're going to work with someone you got to kind of interrogate them so if you're going to pick like a doula a lactation consultant a coc a cbs if you're going to it to your doctor too you need to interrogate them okay you need to look them up because certifications are public look them up um online and see what they have you know ask them a lot of questions don't feel intimidated to ask them tons of questions get their background pick their brain and know what they know you know there's stuff that you can google and there's simple answers but somebody who knows what they know and has been in this field you know educating and doing the work they are going to tell you things in depth they're going to tell you things that you've never heard before they're going to tell you things that you're like oh my god that makes sense that is my biggest thing. And you need, and that needs to be done prenatally before going into the hospital because I promise you it will make the world of a difference. Yeah. So you also kind of mentioned a little bit about one to two hours after birth. And I think people, you know, they always hear this. If you're nursing the crawl up the one to two hours after birth, mm -hmm. let me be clear, you need one to two hours after birth, even if you're pumping too. But let's let's talk about, you know, that first if you do plan to nurse in some way, um, do you have you help women initially, like yeah. start that batch, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that entail? What does it involve? So initially, after they give birth, um, I'm usually when I'm in the hospital, I'm with the mom during that two hour recovery period. So during that time, you know, the mom is doing skin to skin and it's more like a hands off, let's see, you know, what baby does, where the baby does a breast crawl, or if you need to latch baby yourself if baby does not look for the breast themselves but during that um two hour period which we typically call the golden hour hours um things could happen and so like as a labor nurse after that two hour period i would pass you on to the postpartum unit where they are mother baby nurses and the lactation consultant is usually on this uh unit so if you're in the hospital and there's um complications during that period that's when we would reach out to the hospital lactation consultants to come in and assess if there's issues, complications going on, and your plan of care from there. But that two hours just looks so different from ev for everyone. Like in that two hours, somebody could latch just like that. In that two hours, somebody could be ending the two hours and they're like, oh my God, the baby's not latching. You know, in that two hours, there could be a painful latch. I can't do this. What is going on? And that two hours, you could find out, okay, well, I need to exclusively pump because something's going on orally with the baby. So that's very important. Um, and again, that's why we say to prepare and do the work because if, you if you've done your prenatal and you have someone that you're working with that you trust and, you know, that knows their stuff, during this period, this is when you can reach out to them. Because if you're not getting that care, you're not getting that personalized care, this is where they can come in and help you. So let's let let me tell you what I learned. So my um, cousin, my close cousin, I, she's mm -hmm. a labor um, RN. So what I learned from her is that some they don't tell us the difference in the amount of numbers that labor and delivery nurses. And I actually learned it from a client too, because I met a client. We're gonna go there in a minute, but I learned the difference in the numbers of what counts as people when you're in labor delivery and what's what counts as people in postpartum where like labor and delivery would i mean i know it depends on the hospital but like on mm -hmm. average like your nurse may only have four people or mm -hmm. just two people or i don't know the numbers right but in postpartum you, you know yes <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes so in yes 
Yes. And so in my labor unit, we have one, we're a baby friendly hospital. We have one, one labor um, patient and baby. Yeah. So yeah, and, and, and that also determines the type of care you're going to receive. But in the postpartum unit, they may have five or six couplets. So, and, and that, and that's where it gets iffy. And then also on the postpartum unit, you know, there's one LC to all of these patients. And so when they're having issues and the postpartum nurse can't figure it out, like, when is that lactation consultant really going to get to that patient? Yeah. And so let's go ahead. And I was going to say, and most, most hospitals have lactation consultants on schedule from nine to five. What happens to when you're delivering in the wee hours and you're having a complication? So at this point, you have to wait, right? Until they get there. Time is milk. Listen, you, you, done, you done gave the sauce, honey, with the <laughs> milk. Love it. Oh, so, let's talk about the difference. So my cousin is a labor and delivery nurse. She, does not, she mainly does night shift. Mm -hmm. And I had a client that's a labor and delivery nurse and she does night shift. Let's, can we talk about like, in general, some people have noticed like the difference between the attitudes and the people that are in labor and delivery and potentially the people that are in postpartum. Mm -hmm. It's about the system, what I've learned, you know, like you just said, somebody has one patient or maybe two at the most mm -hmm. to five to 10 patients. Like mm -hmm. it creates a difference in what they even can do. Right. Big difference. And like you said, attitude, uh, you may go from like an amazing labor nurse, you know, because she's only working with, you know, she has more time allocated to you versus a postpartum nurse who has five of you, five moms, five babies. She's not going to be as happy. It's, it's so, and then like, you know, the labor delivery, like they, they, they do the first latch there, you know, because then you whisk away and then. You're gone once they get you through delivering, like however long that takes. And then, you know, you could have somebody with complications that maybe half of her staff have half of her client base been in there for three, five days. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it, it really yeah. does make a difference. I just want you all to understand, like, it's not that we shouldn't, ex we just got to understand the system. And like right. when, people, when people say to understand the system, that's what they mean of like, can you imagine if you work somewhere at a job and you just got to focus on one project at a time, right? Let's just take it to the business world. Or right. you projects at a time, you're going to have two different viewpoints. Someone that's one project, oh, yeah. <laughs> and you get somebody that got 10 weeks for a project deadline or somebody that got two days for a project deadline. You know, right. it's just really trying to just understand the difference in all of that and what that creates. Right. Got a question. You know, mm -hmm. I was going to talk. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but go ahead. I know you're going to read my mind. So let me show you how I tune me, Julie and I are. What am I about to ask you about? <laughs> Colostrum. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Y'all, this, 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 I should have did it at the beginning, but I was like, no. Nah, I'm going the right way. The people on here, harvesting colostrum, Julia. Harvesting colostrum. People know the real deal, holy feel, where they can stop these Instagram trends and really get the care that they deserve if they actually going to do it or even know the risk of it. Can we can we get from the nurse perspective, the one that's in the hospital <laughs> and these women actually come up in here and not these social media pages that's just showing you what worked on their journey? Can, can we can we can we go there? Let's go there. Let's go there. Okay, so for harvesting colostrum, first of all, I just want to say, I know that it is a trend on social media, a trend here, a trend there. Everyone selling the colostrum harvesting kits and this and that. Um, not even having the credentials, honestly, to be to be doing that, knowing you know what's out there and knowing that people go on social media and they watch and they're like, okay, well, let me try this you know, with no one working with. Let me also say, if you are going to harvest colostrum, please make sure you are working with a lactation professional and your physician, somebody who knows your medical history, knows if you have um, underlying conditions, knows what you're at risk for. Now, so let's go into some scenarios with harvesting colostrum. Obviously, we know all the benefits that comes with it, but there are many risks and everyone is different. You cannot compare yourself to someone else, you know, and say, okay, well, 
I look healthy, I'm okay to do it. You could look healthy and something can still happen. Um, when you're harvesting colostrum too early, you can send yourself into labor. And I've actually had this at the hospital where a mom has come in 34 weeks, her water broke. She was hot. I mean, she had bags and bags of colostrum. Was she working with someone? Absolutely not. Did her physician know? Absolutely not. But this shows that social media, you know, she's seen this out here on social media and thought it was okay. And then there she was at 34 weeks having to give birth because her water broke. So there are risks. And, and then there's bad risks, you know, something that we call a core prolapse. Say if you could be completely healthy, you could be harvesting colostrum, your water could break from the overstimulation and the, the umbilical cord could come out. And that is a life and death situation. That is something that is very serious. You know, when you're doing these things, you're bringing contractions, if your water breaks, there's risk. You know, there's infections. The, like I said, the baby's umbilical cord. And then there's other things like that are happening within the uterus that you may not see that's going on. You could be bleeding, your placenta could be separating. You don't know the what the strength and the depth of these contractions that you're bringing on by harvesting colostrum incorrectly. So what's the cord, cord prolapse? You said the, what, what now? Oh. What, what? You, you was going, you, you went to Nurse Julia for me. And you, love, <laughs> you know, which is good. Cause like, that's what people need to realize. These people aren't telling you these terms when they're trying to tell you about colostrum, but you lost me. What's the, what's the cord prolapse? Yeah, so cord prolapse is when the umbilical cord is down the vagina. And so when your water breaks, the cord falls out. What? And this is something you may not know that you have. And so if you're home harvesting colostrum and this happens, it's not a good situation. What if it falls out? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the umbilical cord falls out. You, what? No. Mm -mm. Okay. okay. I'm yeah. speechless. Like, so women who have, have like a lot of amniotic fluid, they're at risk for this. And so they should not be harvesting colostrum. So how do you know you have a whole lot of amniotic fluid though? See, that's what I'm saying. Correct. Correct. Some things you don't know. I mean, sometimes they could, you know, diagnose it early on. Sometimes they don't. Okay, I'm speechless now. <laughs> okay. Man. Okay. Okay. So, it's, wow. wow. Yeah, it's just so much in labor. It's just so much, like, just for me, the risk outweigh the benefits, and I just would rather my client wait. Yeah. Just wait. <clears throat> I mean, and the benefits that they preach about on social media you know you'll come with your syringes because everyone thinks that like they don't you've had colostrum you've been had colostrum you know what i'm saying right like the air tactic of like if you don't harvest it you're just gonna you know now i got clients three less than three hours after birth sending me pictures of colostrum that they've gotten out like it's not right. by this scare tactic of like you you gotta do it as soon as third whatever the weeks are you know what i'm right. saying like, yeah, and it is a scare tactic. It's a marketing tactic, um, trying to come on vulnerable, you know, pregnant women who don't know. But I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're marketing saying, you know, do this. So if your baby has low blood sugar, your baby has to be separated from you. This is what you could do. Well, guess what? If you're in the hospital and those things happen, that is what you could do. You could start collecting your colostrum. You can be in labor at the hospital and be expressing your colostrum. I mean... It, it's it's going to do the same thing. At the end of the day, it's going to do the same thing. Whether you do it before or when you're in labor or after you give birth, it's going to do the same thing. Because the amount of the, the amount of time that it can take, you know, some women like they they, they don't they don't even realize. Even if your hand expressing it, like it still can cause. And they're like, oh well, if you can, you know, you can have sex, you can do it. If you can do this, you can do it. But like literally though, it's like, but it's not that, you know, and. Right. They can't even let's be real some women can't do that because their risk level is too high like, exactly but how do you know, you know when you're giving that message out to social media you don't know what anyone's history and background is so it's dangerous for you to just put that out without caveats like fine if you want to talk about it because you want to get the views right mm -hmm. but like caveats they're just like do this and then but then there's all these other reasons why someone wouldn't do it so you don't even say it and it's dangerous right and that's dangerous and that's the thing if you're gonna put that out there and say do this you need to show all and i mean 
<laughs> I listed just a small amount, but you need to show all of what can happen when you're doing it. And then it, there's a technique, like we said, there's a technique. Um, you learn to, to breastfeed and there's a technique to everything. And there's a technique to how you collect colostrum. What if you're overstimulating yourself? You're doing it too much. You just sitting there doing this all day and you're overstimulating, you know, overstimulating that uterus, providing all those contractions to that uterus. So we're going to get out. I'm going to get out the soapbox. <laughs> It just drives me bananas. I remember you. Um, we were talking over text, or we had sending voice notes, and you were telling me because you know people try to come up home on purpose. Not that I care. People try mm -hmm. to come up home on purpose all the time because I say I don't see you if you're harvesting colostrum. I don't mm -hmm. see you if you pump while pregnant. I don't care what social media says, what anybody says. Our practice does not support those two practices. If you want to work with someone, find someone that helps. And I, I'm not referring either because ain't nobody like, oh, purpose sent me to you. And then I don't know what they're doing on the back end. I don't know what they're telling you to do, right? So we don't support that practice. It is what it is. Um, but we just want you to, we will say that you need to talk to your doctor. Um, you need to get, you know, not approval. You know, I know that when these moments of, well, your doctor is not your dad. They can't tell you what to do or your mom and dad. But to them like you know fine if we're talking about like you know that people have other thoughts on feedbacks or this and that and that and this yes like getting you know someone that aligns with your goals but someone right. that actually understands all of the concerns that, that can take place that know your history and background when it comes to if you decide to harvest colostrum and it should not be from anybody with a view coming up on social media because that's just ain't it it's not yeah but that is not it I'm gonna get off the soapbox. So, Julia, we're gonna get, we're gonna, if, if you had a crystal, a crystal ball, right? Like, and I mm -hmm. know we can't change the system, but if you like could make, you know, of course we give them the prenatal education, but like as they're entering in the hospital, you know, what words of advice or thoughts, like if someone had no, because we know as much as we can scream from the hilltops, we're gonna do our job on social media, keep getting out prenatal, prenatal, prenatal. Prenatal, prenatal, prenatal forever. But we know women just because it's ingrained in us to think that we're going to just tackle everything else like we do in life, like blindfolded and we just go. Like we don't realize the importance of, you know, getting the care beforehand sometimes. Right. Um, I, I love that I'm seeing people are starting to do so <clears throat> because of the education we give on social media and because of, mm -hmm. you can't get it from Google. I'm sorry. When you're good at what you do, you're not giving it from Google. But no. if someone is going in, and if you could give your thoughts on anything that you could tell them to just help them navigate all the emotions that take place, all of the, you know, that's a, the potential birth trauma, complications, being seen, being heard. Like, mm -hmm. what do you wish that you could tell your, like the people that come in firsthand of like how to help them through this journey? Honestly, I wish I could tell everyone to, because what I see when they come in, they have like a written birth plan. Mm. Okay. And in this birth plan, you, you really don't see anything about nursing or pumping. I would tell everyone to create a nursing and pumping plan to take with them. Period. That's it. What? <laughs> the entire plan from beginning to end what you want, what you want to do. If the baby's not latching, you, you're going to pump. This is how it's going to go from beginning to end your plan for nursing and pumping. You gave if it everyone was equipped yeah. with that, I think like the emotions, the trauma, that would help with everything because so many mourn, you know, the journey that they wish they had yeah. with breastfeeding. And I just think the outcomes would be so much better. Yeah. <sighs> You gave me chills. You gave me chills. You gave me chills. Um, I did, I'm just reading some of the comments. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, people are, you know, sharing their thoughts. So we're not here. Let me tell you, Julie and I are not are here to change your mind. If your physician has approved you to harvest colostrum, if you <clears throat> are working with someone and you are happy in your decision to harvest colostrum, we mm -hmm. are not here to change your mind. Like, do what works best for you. That's what Julie and I, like, cut from the same cloth. Like, 
regardless of credentials and all the things like we definitely want you to just make informed decisions we really don't care which one you do we just want right. you to be able to make an informed decision so if you decide to harvest collagen or you find out that that act does help with your you know baby's blood sugar if things go wrong you know mm -hmm. from your birth trauma and you don't have regrets you know but we just want the other side of the story to be told because those people don't share those people don't go back and say my core pro prolapse they don't go back and say you know i went into preterm labor they don't go back and say that maybe their baby possibly didn't make it like they don't mm -hmm. say those things if they are pregnant they don't say well i was pumping while i was pregnant i had a miscarriage like those are the stories that don't get told it's all the ones that are the headlines Well, like, i pumped and they show all these syringes everywhere with all this colostrum in it like those right. are the stories that get highlighted because those are the views you know um people don't and they get hushed and then they tell their right. truth and then people are like da, 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 that happened to you and da, 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 da. correct but if it happens to one person that's that's too many that could be something that could have been avoided correct absolutely so, so you know we just want you all to make informed decisions and we will continue um to share that truth because we, we don't care if we different on social media who cares you know our clients need the care that they deserve they show up they show out julian that changing the game and it's all good you know what i'm saying like i bring people on my platform that even if julia supported harvest Colossal, that's fine you know what i'm saying it wouldn't matter you know but and which you can but we just want you all to understand the risk and the benefits and just make an informed decision um someone said i'm more in mind because i had complications and didn't know it would impact my supply i still pump what i can but i really wish i was more informed about different things that could impact your journey yeah it, we get it all the time um oh, all the time yeah so what do you say to someone you know that is struggling in the hospital like if they're there and mm -hmm. and you know nothing nothing on the birth plan went or the nursing and pumping plan first of all you giving the gems out here even to have a nursing and pumping plan um mm -hmm. but what what do you what do you tell them honestly <laughs> that's a good because like at this point like they're, they're they're struggling in the hospital they probably seen the lc and then they're going home no and it's like I wish I could, you know, tell you to, you know, connect you with someone to have when you go home, but they're going home. And honestly, like these journeys are just being sabotaged. Like they're just non-existent. They're going home with formula. And that's usually how the journey ends. It's usually how it ends. And, and I hate to even see it get up to that point where they're in the hospital struggling. You know, they're not, for example, um, I had someone come and she's like, the lactation consultant came at discharge. And I'm just like, oh. We're about to leave. Like, what you gonna do yeah. for me? Yeah. yeah. And all that time has gone past, um, especially if you have the complications and, you know, they just want to shove the baby on and push him there. And, you know, like, yes. with hurt and ripping up bleed nipples in the hospital. You right. have a journey tore up with bleed nipples from the beginning. Like, but I'm like, my, my breast, my nipples are all tore up. And I'm like, wait yeah. a minute. You know, but, I'm, but let's talk about that for a moment because you know now firsthand, like, you had a child that had to get a release done. And mm -hmm. so we, you know, not going to here on the tots and all the things, but like protecting your supply with pumping before your nipples get tore up. Because nursing can impact pumping and pumping can impact nursing. You let your baby has an ineffective latch and it's causing pain, trauma, damage, or your flame mm -hmm. size is too big. It's a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't think people understand how, but, but where does this come? And I know, you know, but it is what it is this pressure that you have to nurse at all costs correct correct and that and that's the thing like the pressure of you have to nurse or just keep trying to nurse just keep going and that whole just keep going just keep trying like i hate that phrase if you see something is wrong the nipples are tore up you know you're in pain they're bleeding they're cracked pump Get, you know give them a pump show them how to use the pump I just don't understand why it's just you have to nurse, you have to nurse, you have to nurse. And honestly, it, I do understand. It's the lack of education with pumping and knowing, you know, how pumping works and things of that nature and all the facts about it. You know how that the pumping ain't breastfeeding and all this and you got to latch, you get the antibodies, you know, <laughs> all the things that are not true. And those are the things that are driving it, honestly. That whole, you need to nurse, you need to nurse, you need to nurse, and then you're tearing up the nipples, and 
messing up journeys, <laughs> messing then, up but, journeys. But then the bad thing is, they say you need a nurse, you need a nurse, they either give you a nipple shield, and then you go all this back and forth over release, not release, tongue tie, not tongue tie, mouth, right. tongue tie. So th these people never even know, like, people I know that's very close to me, they get six different opinions. You know, you got the doctor, you got the nurse, you got, you know, then mm -hmm. when you go home, you bring someone else in privately, you see somebody else in the office, you see your pediatrician, like, you see your OB, like, you got six and seven thoughts and let alone if you got somebody in your family that did any sort of nursing and pumping or the ones they don't when they got all their opinions you know all oh, right you this you. it is so much for a new family to to partake and that's why i just say this you need to listen to one or two voices determine you as a right. other determine who those voices are that you trust mm -hmm. that's it like that's it you have to listen to one or two voices because too many voices it's just too much. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. So you definitely have to listen to those ones that you trust. You know, the, the your lactation professor that you vetted, you know, you can trust them. And then um, when it comes to pediatricians, you guys, they don't know much. Like, the and a lot of pediatricians will admit it. Like, you know, we take like maybe like 20 something hours on breastfeeding. They, you know, that's not really their scope as far as obviously they want your baby to be fed and gain weight, but they will go to alternative feeding methods. They will give formula because they are not specialized in breastfeeding the way that most think that they are. They're really not. So if when it comes to latch issues, don't go to your pediatrician to ask, you know, how to latch or how to pump. You just don't. Community know where to find you <clears throat> let them know about because you know i know people think you gatekeep over here oh <laughs> you know you know two people can't be in the same profession all the things if i need to refer to julia i refer to julia if i need to refer to any other ibclc i refer to ibclc's they all don't have the best rap but it's probably most of the time when people think i talk about it's most of the time not even ones on it's not even the ones on social media it's the ones that's knee deep in the woods and the <laughs> But in places somewhere they ain't know nobody's social media and they journeys. Like, so tell them where to find them. Tell them about your services. Tell them what you offer because I won't, don't want people to think Julie is amazing at what she does. Like, literally. I know that she ain't gonna, gonna tear up your pumping journey while you're trying to get your baby back to breast. Like, but tell them who you are. Tell them where to find you. Tell them about your services. And then I'll let you add anything else in closing. Okay, so you can find me on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram at Blooming Rose Lactation, and that's one word. Um, I do have a website. It is linked in my bio. It's jujurose.com, and on that website, you can um, book if you need to. I offer um, in-home and virtual initial lactation consults, follow-up um, lactation consults. I offer troubleshooting consults if you're having, like, any short issue i offer flange fittings pumping consults return to work consults as well and weighted feeds for anyone that's in the saint cloud orlando kissimmee area yes those weighted fees can, can we can, I, I lied can we can, <laughs> weighted fees that these people keep thinking that you know oh my baby swallows oh my baby i saw some milk on the side of their mouth oh i saw my baby drinking can, can we can we touch on the weighted fees for just a moment Listen, you can you can see that you can see your baby drinking or you know see the milk. Wait, listen, you need a, if any type of issues, you need a weighted feed. If you are working with someone and they and you're having feeding issues and they're not offering a weighted feed, that is a red flag. Okay, because a weighted feed, we're gonna weigh that baby before the baby feeds. The baby is going to feed and we're going to weigh after and we're going to get the exact amount that baby took in. And let me just give an example. I went and I did a way to feed the other day. And, and um, one of my moms, she's like, oh, yeah, she's good. She nursed for 20 minutes. I think she got a lot. Weighed the baby before, weighed after. This is a baby that's having issues with the tongue tie. And the baby took maybe an ounce of milk in. So it's very important to not assume because you could think, you know, baby's eating, baby's taking in enough and not. And guess what? She's doing, you know, pumping to protect supply. Because imagine babies only taking an ounce. How much milk baby's leaving behind? So then she's pumping after and she's getting all this milk that baby's left behind. Yeah. So. So I just, I had to throw that in. And it's not, let's give yeah. professionals credit that, especially that do nursing. 
it ain't your house scale, y'all. I promise you. The, no. the, uh, people like, hey, no, don't be putting your baby on a house scale. I'm thinking, I'm out in ounces just because your scale weight. And I'm saying this, y'all, we hear all the things. And it's like, but y'all listening to these mom groups and these TikTok pages and whatever other pages and Instagram pages. I'm like, it's, no, it's just fun. <clears throat> any reality um so please get the way to feed y'all i'm so glad you've enjoyed this i want to let you give her any final thoughts um but i'm so happy to have her on today i got people texting me they're like oh i can tell you I, I, i'll text you later tell me what they said okay but there's so many people that are enjoying this lab so many people so yes many yes thoughts and thoughts i am grateful that you had me um if we want to do a part two we can <laughs> Because this was amazing. It's amazing. And, um, you know, keep doing the work. Keep doing what you're doing, you know, out here in these pumping streets, getting the word out there. Because, listen, every pumping mom is grateful for you. Thank you. It's my goal. It's my goal. So, y'all, this is it for us. I know we saw the, the, the clapping. It's so informative. Julie is amazing. Julie is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Julie all day. We could talk. We talk outside of social media. She's someone yes. else love dearly we we have each other's personal cell phone numbers like we not mm -hmm. out faking the funk like for social media and we're in the same industry and it's not all this competition crabs in a bucket type mess um, right but I, love, yeah, I love her so much she's an amazing ibclc ibclc's don't always get the best rap but julie is amazing at what she does um so mm -hmm. if it's care when it comes to nursing when it comes to pumping definitely can contact julie she is amazing y'all so we're gonna love y'all and leave y'all i'm gonna take julie up on this part too um if y'all want to <laughs> see something definitely let us know but we definitely really want you to know all the different things about hospital birth lactation and everything else in between postpartum all of this year we didn't even touch on it but we didn't touch on a lot of stuff so yeah i'm gonna take mm -hmm. part two we're gonna figure out when that is and we're gonna be back out here um, to talk with y'all. So, Julia, thank you. You have a wonderful evening, and I will talk to you later. Thanks, love. Uh, bye. All this Instagram, don't, don't glitch. This is going to go up permanently <laughs> on my post, um, on my feed as a post. So, y'all check it out. Tell your friends to check this out as well. Have a good one. Bye, Julia. Bye, y'all. Uh...